Welcome to the new season in the church year, the season of Pentecost. And this Sunday is the day of Pentecost. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. And we're so glad that you are with us. Again, feel free to comment. Let us know you are here. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, please feel free to leave it in a comment or a private message to us. Uh, contact information and how you can reach us is on your screen. Let us know how we can pray for you. An email that uh, was sent out this week indicated that we are working diligently toward being able to worship together in the sanctuary. From our elder deacon meeting this week, it was decided to try to work out the technology before we open the doors. Uh, so those who should choose not to come, uh, that they can be able to attend live with worship on Facebook with us. And uh, it will also take some time, I'm just saying, uh, to ensure the safety of those who are worshiping here on campus. So you can still mail your tithes and offerings or drop them off at the church office Monday through Thursday, 9 to noon. This week, and whoa, it's really glorious to be able to, to say, okay, events this week, this week, tomorrow, Monday at 6.30 p.m., the Trail Life leaders will be meeting on Zoom. The AHG leaders will be meeting on campus in the Koinonia Center. And then we come to Wednesday. Wednesday at 7 p.m. We are resuming our study, Journey to Spiritual Maturity. An email is being sent out to you and we would ask that you please respond if you are planning to attend. And if you are, whether or not you do have the study binder that was issued earlier uh, in our study time. Please respond by tomorrow, by Monday. And if you don't have a, a binder, let us know that as well because the study guide will be provided. The location of where on campus we will be will be determined by the size of those planning to attend. But we are resuming Wednesday night Bible study. This week, the June edition of The Messenger went out, so you should be receiving that. And again, with the monthly plan, it's still flexible, and we'll be keeping you updated as to things that, that we continue to open up and to provide uh, for our congregation. One, one birthday to celebrate this week, Saturday, Juan Villacana. Happy birthday, Juan. With all of that, wherever you are, please stand as we worship together.
awesome. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just praise you this morning. We just, we just come into your presence to, to worship you in all of your glory. And Lord, we know that in and of ourselves we are not worthy. But Lord, we know that through confession before your throne of grace, through a repentant spirit that it's your son's righteousness that clothes us and allows us to enter into the presence of an awesome holy God we thank you for this day a day that we celebrate the outpouring of your spirit upon us. We celebrate the birth of your church and you have given us the power to be able to proclaim the good news to a lost and dying world. Lord, we ask you to open our hearts and our minds to receive from you this day and it's in the name above all names that we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen.
morning on this uh, day of Pentecost uh, is from Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 5. And we begin with verse 15 through the 21st verse. So open your Bibles, turn with me, Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 15, where we read in Jesus' name. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Beyond the upper room, beyond Gethsemane, beyond the cross and an empty tomb, we come to the Mount of Olives. It was on the Mount of Olives Jesus told his disciples to remain in Jerusalem, to wait for the promised gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, reminding them prior to his ascension into heaven to the right hand of the Father. It was here Jesus reminded them specifically, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And it was here Jesus commissioned them. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. It was from the Mount of Olives that Jesus ascended. It is to the Mount of Olives that Jesus will return at his second coming. Then we come to Jerusalem. We see in Acts chapter 1 that the disciples returned to the upper room in Jerusalem to, to wait as Jesus had instructed them. The 11 disciples were there. Also the women who were part of Jesus' ministry, his mother Mary, Jesus' brothers, they waited and they prayed. Waiting is one of the most difficult things we do. We're anxious to get together in the sanctuary for worship, and yet we still must wait. Ours is an instant generation. We can't stand it if our computer is slow. Why save for something if you can get it on credit uh, right now? I won't pull into a gas station if there's not an open pump. And I'll go back to the bank later if the teller line is too long. But waiting, waiting on the Lord is something I have come to understand is absolutely necessary if we are to be in the Lord's will. The disciples wait for the promised gift, yet they go about their business. It was on the Feast of Pentecost that they went to the temple, just as they normally would, 50 days after the Feast of First Fruits. Now, there, are, there are, are two misconceptions that we have about Pentecost today, and, 
And I, and I always like to remind us of those misconceptions. And I'm still surprised at how many still have that traditional thought in their, in their mind. The first is about the name. Pentecost was a feast that had been celebrated since the time of Moses. Instructions for the Feast of Pentecost were given to Moses on Mount Sinai when he received the Ten Commandments some 1,200 years earlier. It was one of the three feasts in which all men were required to appear at the temple in Jerusalem. Worship for the Feast of Weeks or Shavuot in Hebrew began at 9 a.m. Scripture reading for the festival for temple was and continues to be to this day, Exodus 19 through 20, the giving of the Ten Commandments, Ezekiel 1 and 2, the fiery appearance of God, and Ruth, an account set at harvest time. You see, God's planning, God's timing is never a coincidence. When we think about Acts chapter 2, the, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church, we forget that Pentecost was already in existence. We think today we have Pentecost because the church was birthed on that day. The second misconception is the location where the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2 want us to look at the first two verses. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Together in one place, the whole house where they were sitting. Back to chapter 1, verse 12. We see the disciples in the upper room. They're gathered together, they're waiting, they're praying. And we think, as artists have given us pictures through centuries, everything beyond that takes place in that location. But in verse 15, we find more than an intimate group of disciples, more than just the 11. We find a group of believers about 120 are gathered together. Where would they be gathered? Significant to understanding the location is the term house. We think whenever we hear house, we think of our homes, right? We think of the upper room when we read the word house in Acts. But the reference to the word house in Acts is the temple. The temple was referred to as the house. Solomon referred to it. Stephen in his testimony before the Sanhedrin before he was stoned referred to the fact that Solomon built a house for God. And so that brings us to 
the place at the temple, the southern steps of the Temple Mount. It was a place that was used for gathering. It was a place that was used for teaching. It was a, a place where thousands of people would enter and leave the Temple Mount. It was a place where water was available in mikvahs, locations for ceremonial cleansing before ascending to the temple. What is the significance of water in the area of the southern steps? Well, we just have to continue on through to see Peter in chapter 2 preaching. And what happens when Peter preached? 3,000 souls were saved. And what do we know about the 3,000? That they were also baptized. And so we have the location of water at the southern steps. We know from Peter's sermon that day, it was 9 a.m. People commented on the fact that the disciples had to have been drunk. Peter's defense was that it was only the third hour of the day, which is 9 a.m., the time of morning prayer, where? At the temple. Location is important because it, it really helps us understand what really happened. Most important is the impact of the event itself. What is the significance of the special gift Jesus left us, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit? How does it, how should it affect our lives? The filling or controlling of the Holy Spirit is a profound reality in the believer's life. And understanding it can change your life. What does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? We'll answer that question this morning by looking at reasons for a Spirit-filled life. Requirements for a Spirit-filled life and, and results of the Spirit-filled life. First of all, the reason for a spirit-filled life is obedience. God has commanded us to be filled with the Spirit. And this is not a suggestion or a request. It, it's a command. It's a biblical mandate. The verb here in the Greek is in the imperative mood. It's imperative that we be filled with the Spirit. God commands it. It's plural. It's not just for one, it's for every believer. And the verb is present tense, indicating that it's an ongoing command. That means constantly, moment by moment, being controlled and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Are you continually filled? Does the Spirit of God control you moment by moment? The second reason for a Spirit-filled life is obligation. We believers have tremendous responsibilities that we must fulfill. We have an obligation for our life of worship. It is to be alive with joy in the reality of Christ. And this is to overflow. It's the overflow of our spirit-filled life. We have an obligation to our families, love and submission, cannot be displayed apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. We have an obligation in our work life. A spirit-filled believer should be the one who works the hardest 
and has the best attitude. We have an obligation in our life of spiritual warfare. We are at war. Ours is a fight to the finish with a sinister enemy. There are no holds barred. He will do whatever it takes to kill and destroy. How can we stand against the attacks of the enemy? Only by being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there's a third reason for a Spirit-filled life. Opportunities. Verse 16 is a reminder that we are to use our time and our opportunities wisely. What golden opportunities slip through your fingers because the spirit is not in control? Our nature tells us that we, we want to be filled to have pleasure in living rather than power in serving. And Acts 1.8 tells us that we are given the power of God to share what he has done for us. Oh, how we need that power for the opportunities to come into our lives. There are reasons for a spirit-filled life, and there are also requirements. There are requirements to graduate from college or high school. There are requirements for certain jobs, professions. You can't be a paramedic without knowing first aid. There are requirements for a spirit-filled life. And the first is surrendering your life, surrendering, surrendering your life to Christ. Surrender involves abandoning our will. Not only our will, our intellect, our emotions, as well as our time, our talent, and our treasure. We abandon everything to God's control. And it's a proactive process. We are involved. We need to take the steps to turn off the TV and pick up the Bible. We need to clean house and get rid of questionable reading material and videos. We need to do. Certainly the Lord can do anything. But like the children of Israel entering the promised land, the priests had to step into the raging Jordan River before God would wall up the water to allow them to cross on dry land. We need to surrender. A second requirement is studying the Word of God. Parallel passage is found in Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. I'll be referring to that passage. Uh, if you turn your Bibles over to Colossians 3, Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. Let the word live there. Feed yourself on a steady diet of the word of God. Third requirement for a spirit-filled life is to stand in the presence of Christ. Verse 18 of our text tells us not to get drunk on wine. A person who is going to be full of wine keeps close to the source and the supply of wine. We need to be close to our Lord Jesus if we are going to be full of his spirit. When we stand in his presence, we are at the very source and supply of his spirit. And that brings us to the third aspect 
of the Spirit-filled life. Results. The first result is in our speech, expressing God-given truth. Peter is a good example. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, read his sermon. And then turn over to chapter 4. Read how he expresses himself before the Sanhedrin. Another example from the New Testament is the Apostle Paul. He, he expressed God's truth everywhere he went. And it's not just for apostles of old. We are told in Colossians 4, verse 6, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to respond to each person. A result of the Spirit-filled life is in our singing, expressing God's given joy, in sacrificing, expressing God-given thanks, and in submitting, expressing God's given love. The Spirit-filled life is one that is completely surrendered to the Lord's control. And as a result, produces undeniable spiritual fruit. A number of years ago, there was an article about a tragic plane crash in the Fort Worth, Texas Telegram. A young student pilot was making one of his final training flights and evidently he, he froze at the controls and his instructor yelled at him, turn over the controls, turn over the controls. The student did not. Both were killed in the crash. Tragedy can occur when those who are in training don't turn over the controls to the wiser instructor. To be filled with the Spirit of God means turning over the controls of our lives to Him. Amen.
we need to hear your voice and to hang on what you have called us to do as your people. Lord, the power that you poured out on that day 2,000 years ago is just not is not weakened through the years. It is your power. And Lord, all we have to do is, is look around us and to see a, a lost, a, a dying, a depraved world Lord, just stir up within us that boldness to proclaim the good news, to continue to seek out people, to introduce them to you. Lord, we pray for those lives who have been changed by, by the violence going on across our nation. Just brings back memories and I was in the thick of it you know over the Vietnam rebellion unrest on campuses and in our cities and Lord your spirit changes hearts changes lives Oh, how we need that today. Lord, we're mindful this morning of Mike Silva Sr. who's struggling with cancer. Lord, just direct the doctors as to how to proceed. Lord, just, just touch him to surround his family with, with your love. And for Georgia Carson's daughter, Dana, who has been struggling with, with that dreaded disease. And it seems as though it has completely taken over. Lord, even in an unconscious state, we know that people can hear and receive the good news. And Lord, we pray for, for her family, for her husband, and particularly for her three or three and a half year old daughters. Lord, just to surround them with your comfort. Lord, in the midst of this, this devastating trial, Lord, just pour out your peace. Give them your peace. And Lord, we Pray for Terry Kenny as he is traveling back home now. But uh, Lord, as he continues to travel, as he is moving to uh, to Wyoming, Lord, uh, keep him safe throughout the move. And Lord, just bless him as he will be spending time with his daughter and and granddaughter. But glorious blessings for him. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us a, a way to come together, lift our voices before your throne of grace. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>